All right, all right. Today we're hanging out with Michael Cup from Cup My Plumber. I'm based out of Danville, Indiana. And today we're talking about um, service and repair and new construction and renovations, uh, doing about $2.3 million per year. And what does it take to maintain that? You know, so Mr. Michael, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, first, how, how did, when did you start your company and, um, and how long did it take for you to make your first million dollars? Believe it or not, I only started in 2017. So nice. I haven't been, and it wasn't even officially started until 2018. Um, so I kind of went out and just bought, what was it? A 2012 Dodge minivan and it's called a workman, but it's a minivan, but it don't have no glass in the sides or back. And that first year, I, I started out doing some uh, custom homes and some custom bathrooms with some general contractors that I've worked with in the past. And uh, uh, ended up about three months into it, had to hire a guy. Uh, so I had a licensed plumber riding around with me as well. And I think we generated, uh, and we only worked through uh, Monday through Thursday, Tony. Uh, we didn't wow. do Fridays, uh, uh, Saturdays or Sundays. And, uh, and it, was, it was like mostly, like I said, custom work, custom homes and stuff. So, um, um, and we ended up doing 274,000 that first year. I'm going to say That's six, really to nine months into that year, um, ended up, uh, that's when I started realizing like, this is going to be, you know, this is turning into a real thing. Uh, so that's when I started looking at payroll companies, hiring a CPA and all that kind of stuff, just to make sure we get all the, the ends, you know, uh, or, or loose ends tied so we can, you know, move on into 2018 and actually make cut my plumber official. Nice, nice. I, yeah, I, I, very common, by the way, you're not alone. You know, a lot of guys, they'll, they'll start a business and it'll take off on them. And then we kind of come back year two, maybe even three, and we're tying some loose ends as far as like um, putting systems in place. The books, right. taxes, right, and um, and then you got the other guys that start with a business plan and a loan and and, and a team and all this other stuff, and it's um, it's a, it's a different process. And so yours uh, has been a lot of fun, I'm sure. You know, oh, yeah. and um, the birth of the success is is an amazing birth when you go through this process. So, congratulations, brother. Um, we Thanks. have some pretty good. I can thank social media quite a bit for my success. I mean, if you would have tried to do this 20 years ago, it would when you had to pay 10 grand in the yellow pages and, and and try to get your name out there, it was just impossible. But social media, uh, and I mean, I encourage anybody that has the mentality to start their own business. Uh, it ain't easy. I mean, it's like it's not easy at all. Uh, probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. But to sit there and just take five thousand dollars and buy a truck. And I mean, I didn't have a, I worked out of my house, you know, I'd go play, buy the parts as I needed them and just be able to turn 500 or 5,000 into 274,000 in my first year of business is just, uh, it was just awesome. That is awesome. Um, I'm so glad you brought up social media because I feel like a lot of the plumbing business owners don't lean as, or maybe they tried social media and it didn't work out for you right and so there's a rhythm to the madness right yeah. there's you can't just like post something and see what happens you got to learn a strategy implement it you know um i i know you're real big on social media i i personally love it i, I spend a lot of money on social media ads so i'll piggyback on that but i want to i want to give you a chance to talk tell us what should a plumbing business owner do to on social media in order to try to you know make it make like, so it doesn't just peel out and spin tire, but it actually grips up and gives you some results. What would you recommend? What makes a difference between everybody else and a successful? My, my, my strategy is a little different because everybody has this misconception that if you don't grab the audience in the first three seconds or whatever, they're gone. And I've kind of found the opposite because um, those customers that if you can't grab them in three seconds, they're gone. They're probably not really the customers that I want. Um, I actually, I'll put in a post about 
thermal expansion and use a plastic bottle water, setting it out on your sidewalk as an example and educate the uh, customer and then jump into the water heater part. And then, hey, if you ever need a plumber, keep us in mind. And there's a lot of people that want to be educated and learn about their homes and thermal expansion and stuff. So they, and they are long-winded things, and, and there'll, there'll be a couple of people that'll laugh at me and make fun of me about it, but the, the strategy works. Uh, the outside spigots was another one. I actually had a cutaway drawing of the outside spigot, and, you know, and this is, it shuts the water off in the conditioned space, and it leaves, but if you leave your hose on, it's like putting your finger on top of a straw and it holding all the fluid in there, then it freezes and splits. So, like I said, I, I try to reach out and not do, oh, uh, free plumbing tune-up or, or, or $25 or any drain cleaning or $100 off. I don't try to market that strategy, you know, for coupon clippers and all that kind of stuff. I, I, like I said, I try to get, reach out to the people that care about their home, want to learn about their home and, and educate that people. And, and, and then hopefully uh, they'll put their trust into me. Yeah. You know, I love that you said you're educating them because um, I, I love that strategy too. That's what that's what I do. I'll come off with like, how do you get plumbing leads? You know, and give you a couple of strategies. And if you need help, I can help you too, right? Um, and some stuff's long winded, like you said. Yeah. And some stuff's not. I love the fact that you you brought up the the three seconds and, and trying to yeah. grab their attention. And um, you're you're right. You're right. So and that's also for a certain audience to piggyback on that. That's like a cold audience and you're just trying to grab their attention and that's not that's not really plumbing isn't like an emotional purchase that where you got to grab their attention and persuade them plumbing is like a problematic service and it's like yes. i'm only gonna buy this only because it's broken and i never want to do this again you know and so it's a because it's a buy, different buying process some of the advertising things don't always work right? And so you found what works for you. That's the bomb. Um, I highly encourage all the plumbers to do how-to videos and then have a call to action at the end. Yeah. Um, I personally like my favorite three are the like the easiest. I think they're fairly simple. I always I always give the same recommendation to, to the guys whenever they ask, well, what do I say? Right? So simple stuff. You can uh, teach them how to flush a water heater, right? Teach them, uh, teach the women how to remove the hair from a pop-up assembly and put it back, right? Uh, teach them how to reset a garbage disposal. Things that take us like less than five minutes, right? So right. you don't really need like a big production team and lights, camera action. You can pop off with your phone nowadays. And um, it's so easy. And I'm glad you found it was easy. You know, maybe it wasn't so easy for, for, for you, but it became easy after so long, right? Yes. Yeah, one so. uh, one thing I really and uh, I I'm not to talk manufacturers or whatever, but I use a sump pump that has the piggyback design, which we're talking to a plumbing audience, so everybody yeah. knows that. But oh, yeah. you get the plug that plugs into the back of the other one of that piggyback. Well, I don't know how many times that saved my butt because they'll call up 10, 30, 11 o'clock, nine. My sump pump's not working. Water's coming up. It's right at the edge, getting ready to come into my basement and all that. And I ask them, I say, hey, uh, how many how many cords is coming out of your sump pump? And they'll say, two, two. And I, this happens like once every three weeks at least. And I said, okay, well, it, unplug the one from the back and plug it directly into the outlet and, bypass, and it bypasses the float. That first plug sends oh. Electricity down to the float, then the float engages, then it comes back and powers the motor. So we'll do the, and then the, oh my gosh, it's working, you know, and you're a hero over the phone. And they do, they feel so self accomplished that they, uh, uh, that they know how to do that. And I'd even do that on uh, whenever I used to do a lot of uh, plumbing inspections. And I go through and check all the stops and the water levels and the back of the soils and stuff like that. And if they had the dual float design on their sump pumps or their sewage injector pumps, I'd bring them down to their basement and educate them and show them how they could bypass. And, you know, oh, now I, I know more of my husband. <laughs> and, and so, <laughs> so it's, it's uh, I, and I really try to promote that piggyback design on any products I put in people's home because just the sewage injector pumps I just mentioned. Uh, no technician wants to try to swap out a sewage injector uh, pump in in a uh, in a full pit. 
So it is kind of nice to go in there, how old your pump, eight, 12 years or whatever, 90% of the time it's going to be a float. Let's just bypass it, empty it out. Then we can swap out uh, with an empty pit. I love it. Uh, it sounds like you have a good niche, right? Because that's a niche. Not every area has some pumps, right? Some some just don't even have them. Oh, pumps. yeah. I didn't um, think about that. No, which is great, though. So if you're listening, if you're a plumber and you're listening to this podcast, to this interview with Mr. Michael Cup, and you also deal with sump pumps, sewage ejection pumps, right? Grinder pumps, all that good stuff. Um, let, let us know what what. Tell us some, you know, what area you're in and what do you prefer to do when you get that call? You know, um, I think that Michael has a good point. So, um, Michael, I, I love that uh, you, you, I think we opened our business right around the same time. We did. Okay. Right? 2017. Great. I, I love that. You know, very, very interesting. Um, uh, not too long ago, we were chatting, you and I, before this podcast, I think a couple of weeks ago, and I said, well, what's one of the best practices that you feel that allowed you to make your first million? And you said customer service, building technicians, and not overworking the techs and keeping them fresh. Can you piggyback on that and tell us what you mean by that? Absolutely. I'd love to. Uh, my number one priority, our mission statement is world-class customer service. I mean, uh, I, we, we, you know, we do the phone call 45 minutes before they head, uh, they, we head that way. We, we got them a, a text message before we go that way. Um, we do uh, um, put them in three time slots. If we're not going to, we're going to miss one of them time slots because we're held up. We don't wait till the end of that time slot to give a call. We try to give them a call. We'll, we'll call the technicians out there. Hey, you got 11 to two today. How's your job going on? We'll be here another hour and a half. We'll make phone call, Mr. Jones. Uh, you know, Jim's ran into a little trouble on his first one. You're, we're still going to be in that eleven to two time frame, but it might be after lunch. You know, closer to that one to two o'clock time, or we might have to push her two to five. But we try to let them know uh, ahead of time, uh, protecting the customers' assets at all time. Uh, that that's uh, huge. We don't. Um, put tools on top of lavatories or on top of kitchen sinks. Uh, if we're anywhere working, I supply the four by six tarps uh, to put down in front of them. I got three, uh, two, three by 15 foot runners that I put on every truck. And like I said, we, we want to really respect the people's homes. Um, the, the second item was the skilled technicians. It, just trying to put a body in a truck is just a complete nightmare. You know, uh, I've learned that. I've worked yeah. behind them and stuff. I've had to go on recalls behind these guys. And I would much rather pay a little bit more uh, for the right person than to sit there and try to clean up and uh, clean up messes and put out fires all the time because we just had the wrong people out there. So, and I'm really, I think, honestly, in, in the central Indiana area i think we're the last plumbing company that actually uses copper um the the, the way industry is going here is just pushing pushing pool fittings and, and you know service plumbing softeners you know water heaters faucets toilets and etc cetera, etc cetera. um when i say skilled we're the last skilled so now uh you know the the bath uh, master bath re renovations or custom baths custom homes and stuff um People are now reaching out to us because they can't find out, find anybody else to do it. We got a house in Greencastle that they did the first rough in the basement. And then time it came around and they got all the walls floored and stuff like that. They called that plumber in for the second rough and they're like, we don't do that type of work anymore. And yeah. it's not, I don't think it's because it's not pro profitable. It's just you can't find anybody that knows how to do it. And then when you're talking about body jets and freestanding tubs and rain cans and all that kind of stuff, I mean, that, there's a lot of lot that, thought that goes, and you have to be experienced to do that kind of stuff. So, yeah. and I'm not saying I don't give out because I, you know, I do hire apprentices and I have the apprentices run because on these big projects, I always want two guys. Um, I, even on water heaters, I want two guys so they can, and then, you know, I'll get to the apprentice and I'll be like, hey, what's uh uh, you know what, like we, cause I do a weekly one-on-one -on -one, and if you got 10 guys, so every 10 weeks I'll have a one-on-one -on -one with that guy. And then we set, uh, we celebrate his wins and then we set more goals and what kind of challenges, but I'll get to the point of, okay, what calls do you feel comfortable that you could, I, you could go out and do by, by yourself? Well, I can do a water heater now, or I can do a, uh, a, a, a sewage injector pump back. And 
every once in a while I'll throw them a bone or we get overloaded and one of them calls come in, I'll pull that helper from that custom bathroom and let him go run a garbage disposal call. So and it kind of helps out in that thing. And then the not overworking text, I'm, I've been around this industry for 28 years and I can pull the same numbers with my technicians running 35 or less calls a month than any other company running 60 or 80. And I've compared them a hundred times. The last time I worked for a company in service, I did 29 calls for $37,743, I think is what the number was. And only in 29 calls. And I think the second place guy that month was like 23 grand. Now you gotta understand this was several years ago too. But uh, yeah, my guys, I got them running thirty-five to forty-five thousand dollars a month on thirty-five calls or less, and and, and Monday through Friday, uh, the only emergency service we do is for um, um, for uh, uh, warranties issue only. So if I came to your house on Tony and or Tony who came to your house and put in a fifty-gallon gas water heater on Friday, and you wake up Saturday morning, you don't have no hot water, I'm going to make sure we're going to come and take care of you. But if you wake up on Saturday morning and don't have no hot water and you give us a call, no, but we can get you first thing Monday. And that's just a, it's just kind of kind of way we, we've done things and, and it's the techs like it, you know, because plumbing's a part of their life. It's not their life. And these guys run into the emergency service for a week on time and, and you know, 80 hours a week and stuff. It, it just, it gets to you. I agree. I've been, bur I've been burnt out. And um, I get it. I, I agree with you. I, I think, you know, if you run three calls a day on average, you should be turning one of those into something bigger. So you should yeah. run three calls every day. Right? You no. should like, find something to dig up or repipe yeah. or reroute, and you should be there for a day or three, you know, maybe a week if it's a juicy one. Right. And so I remember my numbers really well as well. And, and I remember, 30 calls was the average, you know, because you're only wearing um, Monday through Friday, which is five days a yeah. week, just 20 days out of the month, not 30, right? Yeah. And somebody's got a different schedule and it applies. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your story as we talk about like, hey, how did we get to the, to make, you know, a million bucks? I also like to talk about what held you back? That's the next question. What do you feel was one of the things that held you back from cracking that first million? Um, I think the the hardest thing, I, I I call it like stairs, if that makes sense. And what it is, is basically, and I wish I had a drawing board. I, I teach in pictures, so, um, but, uh, but if you take a stairs and you're on the climb up, this part's real easy. Cause I mean, just everything's booming and stuff like that. But then all of a sudden you flatten out and plateau. And now you're trying to make of adjustments of all the growth and everything like that. And then right before you get to ready to go up to that next step, that's where your capital gets tight, your <laughs> labor gets high. Uh, just uh, that that little learning curve right there before you're getting ready to ramp up to that next step is just uh, it's something. I mean, I'm excited about re going up to the next level, but it, it's uh, that that's just the most scariest moment you know, uh, for, for, for me, it, whenever we reach that spot. And I mean, you could even kind of look at history and stuff and kind of know when that's coming, but it doesn't matter what you do to prepare for it. Um, it it's, it, you're, you're going to get, <laughs> you're going to get beat up a little bit. This, this is my experience, uh, was that, um, also, like I said, we're skilled technicians. So, uh, anymore, uh, I will, I, I, I work, I teach, at the plumbing school here locally. And uh, we have, I think it was 834 students this year. And everybody's required to do a copper exam and uh, a practical for the state of Indiana, a copper PVC and a cast. And the copper, I, I'll, I'll like help teach that and work in a shop with them and stuff. And they're like, I'm sorry, this looks like crack, but I've never touched copper before. Or, or, or my employers don't let us use copper. Uh -huh. And and I'm telling you, 90% out of 800 and some students, 90% of them has never used a torch. And that's, I mean, trying to use two hands with a torch and stuff for your first time. And 
you know, not cook the cook. Every, yeah, it's just, and like I said, you can't find skill in everything we do, as you kind of notice in the background here, uh, everything we do is copper. So uh, that that's that's probably a really hard one is to find because I need that extra van for that extra thirty five forty. Every time I hire a skilled technician, that's another thirty five to forty thousand dollars of uh, revenue that's going to be generated for my business every month. So and, and to, to find that right guy that can do that, it, that that's really hard. Okay, that's really really good. I love that uh, you found some time. You've won your time back, and now you're teaching. Is this a passion of yours? What, 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 why did you teach? Why are you teaching? And where, where yeah. are you teaching again? The local school, or what is it? Uh, it it's uh, it's for the Indiana Plumbing Commission and uh, Indiana uh, Licensing Agency. So uh, in our state, you have to have 576 classroom hours and 7,600 OJT hours in order to and pass the practical exam in order to qualify to take the state license. Plus you have to be enrolled in our school for four calendar years. So if you don't get enrolled until August and you graduate in May, you're not even allowed to take that exam until three months later into that August. So uh, they're, they're pretty strict. Um, and I'm glad because that you don't have to be a licensed electrician in the state of Vienna because the way they look at it is if you screw up, you burn down one house, kill one family. But in the plumbing industry, uh, if you do a cross connection and contaminate the potable drinking system, I mean, you can, you know, you, you can uh, harm. I mean, look at this uh, Flint, Michigan. I know there was uh, salmonella over in Colorado where it took them like seven weeks to find out where the source was even coming from. And I mean, I think there were it was a big 300 and 13 people are hospitalized because of the contamination, but they were under Bottled Water Act. And some of the businesses like your restaurants and stuff went out of business because they had no potable water to serve, you know, uh, serve their customers with or clean dishes with or, or anything. So um, plumbing, I try to stress my time. Uh, I mean, what, what's the old uh, American um, standard poster with the guy and all the people standing around yeah. saying protecting the health of the nation? And it's true. So, um, but as far as the schooling was, is it, I really thought it was a volunteer thing. And I, I will tell you this story. I hope I don't burn up your time. Um, so one of the teachers, he was never my teacher, but he was at one of these cookouts that one of the supply houses was having. And I went up there and I asked him, I said, hey, uh, uh, you, uh, you still teaching? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm still teaching or whatever. And I said, yeah, that's always been a dream of mine. And that is, I mean, I've either wanted to be a, a, a teacher or a police officer. Don't know why, but that's something I've always wanted, and I ended up being a plumber. But uh, so I told him, I said, yeah, that's always been a dream of mine, and blah, blah, blah. So two weeks later, I get a call from the school. It said, hey, Mr. Cup, we heard that you were be interested in becoming a, a teacher. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'd, I'd love that. So they sent me the chapter one. This is like three books ago. The chapter one of Plumbing 101 book. And it was talking about the inventor, invention of the toilet and it's John Crapper or whatever. And I was supposed to present and prepare a 20 minute lesson to give to the plumbing board. I mean, this is nervous, you know? And I guess there was 11 other applicants that were doing that. And they had two positions open, a first year uh, teacher and a third year apprentice teacher. So I, I just, I just couldn't teach the toilet thing. So I have a mail, uh, a big thing that I did do, uh, that I made for my guys uh, to diagnose well pumps. So it had, uh, uh, you know, the, the breaker on one side and then it had the pressure switch and then it had the well head and I had a light bulb down at the bottom of it and, you know, ran the wires underneath, had switches. I could make things go wrong with the well. So I went in there and taught the, the plumbing commission board how to diagnose a well pump. Well, about two weeks later, they said, congratulations, Mr. Cup, you got the job. And I said, all right, yeah, I'm excited. And bear in mind, I thought it was volunteer. They said, you are now the new third year plumbing instructor. And I go, oh. And they said, oh, you don't sound very happy. And I said, well, I said, I wanted, I was shooting for the first year spot. And she says, why is that? And I said, because if I mess up, they won't know any better. <laughs> 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 so I ended up, I ended up uh, taking that third year spot. And I think July will be 20 years that I've been doing that. So, and I was blessed. I didn't get paid a lot that first 10 years. And then as the school grew and got bigger, 
And I mean, now we're up to 800 and some students or whatever. So uh, I've been very well compensated through 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 the years uh, to, for, for my talents. That's such a cool story. So you've been teaching this whole time and now you open your business in 2017. Sounds like you probably have a really good source to hire some decent guys. <laughs> yeah, well, right. I'm going to say everybody that's ever worked for me was a student of mine in the past, but they're an extremely strict on trying to, you know, recruit from the school because uh, it would not be fair because it is twenty twenty two hundred dollars a year uh, per student. And I sit there and if I'm paying my guy twenty two hundred dollars a year and he's going to go sit, sit in front and be inspired and motivated by another guy from company B. And then he's like, hey, hey, John, you want to you want to come work for me? I mean, that that would just I mean, that's just kind of unethical and stuff like that. But it is nice because you do get and then a year later, six years later, go, hey, yeah, I had you in school. I mean, I've had guys from 10 years ago, you know, come in here to interview. Uh, yeah, you were my third year te teacher, you know, and, and stuff. So so it does help in the recruitment process in that way. That's amazing. That's such a good story. I love to hear these good stories. Um, got a couple more questions here. Um, at this point in time, what do you feel your plumbing company needs help with at this moment? Uh, I put a couple of notes here, so I'm just trying to, uh, uh, I, I think um, the one thing that's really, really hurt me is, and I really blame it on the COVID thing, is trying to find a, a good CPA. And um, see, I'm real strong in plumbing and real weak in books. So my thing is, is you just find somebody to do your books. And I do want to get to that point where I have a personal office and have a CPA for $55,000, $65,000 a year uh, to work in my actual uh, uh, at Cut My Plumber and then um, do the payroll instead of having to subcontract out. Now, I think that would just pay in the long run, especially when you're talking about multi-million dollar bills so um that the final cpa all of them now just seem like they want to be remote you know they don't want to get up uh, you know and go anywhere i need somebody here on a i told them i what i've been requesting from a few companies is i want somebody here you know weekly or bi-weekly and then as you know as we get a little better at what we're doing we can you know, let out the leash a little bit, maybe once a month come and then get to it where it's at least once a quarter and, and, uh, and just remotely then kind of do it, but you can't find nobody to do that. And it's just like, well, I mean, you guys work for me, you know, you guys are charging me $2,500, $3,000 a month. You know, I want you here. I, you know, I, we, I, we want training. We don't want to be so dependent on you for the rest of our life. So we want, we want training on this. And, and that's what I want. That's been really hard is trying to get somebody to, to properly do the books and then uh, capital, you know, we're on that step thing. And then we get to that end. And when we get toward that end where we're getting ready to hit that big growth, it just seems like the catapult kind of disappears. And I think part of and it's not really they disappear. Uh, uh, the accounts receivable gets real high. <laughs> and it's yeah. just like, it's like, man, I, dude, if this one dude would pay, <laughs> you know, because you got vendors out there, you know, wanting their money and stuff. And it's just like, man, so that it, it's bouncing around tens and thousands of dollars a month. I mean, just we move, moving so much money in and out uh, on, on a daily or weekly basis. It's just insane. That's a good point. You you guys do move a lot of money around. You got to float some jobs, payroll. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts in, in the mm -hmm. plumbing company. And then you're doing new construction and renovations on top of service and repair. So there's a lot going on. I totally get it. Um, I wanted to talk about real quick to piggyback on hiring the right people, right? And it's like, um, COVID did just deal with uh, like the CPAs. Also, I feel like COVID kind of hurt the plumbing industry a little bit with this these checks they were handing out and made some of the plumbers a bit lazy. And and it's weird. Yeah. It's like they now they don't want to come back to work. And now it's like this weird plumber has been birthed, you know. And it's not like yeah. back in the day. It's just so strange how um, they seem to be a little bit more entitled. I'm not here to offend anybody. Um, if anybody listened to this and if you agree, let me know. And if you disagree, let us know respectfully, right? Um, but to piggyback on hiring, um, I think it's one of the most important things um, 
Like, cause we're, we're really good at what we do and we're supposed to duplicate ourselves. And so like, I feel like a lot of times we'll, we'll bring in an applicant and hope, hopefully, or not hopefully, they should be able to do the work and hopefully they work out, right? And I feel like a lot of the times us as humans or business owners, we we accept what's being handed to us or um, we kind of adapt to what they got going on and try to build them up, right? Try to build them up. Um, and you're probably really good at that because you're a teacher. So if anybody's yeah. good at that, it's going to be you, yeah. right? But um, when you don't have that kind of like, time or resources or, or training or, you know, and you just need somebody good in, in that seat to, to fill that position and, and go and help you fix stuff in the business instead of wait for them to tell you, for you to tell them what to do. Hiring um, has been one of the, probably one of the hardest things inside of like every business, including mine, you know? And so I ended up creating this thing uh, to help Plumbing business owners hire not just plumbers, but apprentice. We could also help you hire um, dispatchers, uh, managers, accountants, just about anybody. And the way that I do it is I help you employ a recruiting strategy. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's advertising a job opportunity. If you think about it, that's what it is. It's advertising a job opportunity. The first word is where I come into play, advertising, right? And so when you hire a good plumber, um, you you interview them. But you know, I created this uh, official plumber's test. And this test has got over 40 questions that is designed to test the plumber's qualifications with questions mm -hmm. ranging from water heaters um, to basically water, drain, gas, and some service and repair questions. Um, this, this helped me a lot because I got some questions in there that will like, like, this is a good one for you, Michael. Um, if a plumber says he runs seven calls a day, that's, that's probably not going to be a good fit for you. Right. You want to hear him yeah. say three a day, right? Yeah, that's five missed opportunities in my eyes. <laughs> yeah. <He's> rushing <laughs> through them, rushing through them, trying to get to the next one. So when hiring somebody, if anybody listening to this needs help hiring anybody at your shop, Go visit this website, okay? It's called www. www. There's three W's in there. Uh, plumberhiring.com. All right, plumberhiring.com. This service is um, only $349 a month. It's not expensive. It's probably like one or two hours of your of your of your your time, like what you guys charge as a plumber. And what we do is we advertise your job opportunity over 20 different um, advertising platforms, like Indeed and Facebook and all these other ones, right? So you can go out and do it yourself, which is probably what everybody is doing, or you can have somebody help you with it. Um, so we help you craft your offer. I feel like, um, I think a lot of you guys probably went through crafting your offer. It's like, hey, we need to hire a plumber or somebody at our shop. Um, what are we going to offer, right? It's like uh, the hours and, and how much per hour and what else? You got to make it sound sexy, Right, yeah. gotta make, make it sound appealing. Make it sound like, oh man, I, that's juicy. I want to be a part of that, right? And so the so there's like sign on bonuses and four hundred one k's. There's all kinds of stuff you can add, right? And so everybody like you know has their own strategy. So if somebody listening to this podcast needs help with hiring plumbers, you know where to go, or anybody else in your company, you know. Um, you know, it's funny I, that you. I I forgot I even did that, but for a year or two. I actually made up my own little plumbing test. I don't think it was quite 40 questions, but even on the last page, I had a picture of a little cabin in the woods and it was just a little one bath little thing. And it's just like, how many feet of, of hot water pipe are you going to use on it? Or it might've been how many feet of copper because it's years ago, how many copper, uh, how many feet of copper would you use in this? And just see if they could figure out, you know, uh, what drain size would this be? And, and just like, uh, like five questions about plumbing this little little one room cabin <laughs> with a with a a bath and a, a toilet and a sink. So uh, that's that's neat that you do that. Yeah, I like your idea too. I think it's awesome. Um, what's I, what else is neat is uh, Michael Cup's um, hobby. 
the next question is, what do you spend it on? You know, what do you do with all this stuff? Like, so we went from, you know, being a teacher um, and then now owning a $2.3 million business per year. What do you like to do for fun? What do you spend it on? Uh, I got so many hobbies. It's not even funny. Uh, it, uh, the, my newest thing, well, as you can see, the one I'm kind of filtering out is the 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 Tin Man is what we uh, call it. Uh, it's my uh, uh, drag car, and I was I've been traveling around the nation for about three years with my with the Tin Man, and uh, um, I think he's going to pull up a video here. There you go. I don't even know which one. That one. Oh, that's a picture. Let's see. No, this is the video. Check this out. I'm going to hit. Play. Okay. Now, believe it or not, I got about one hundred seventy-four thousand in that car. Uh, it's a lot of money that build it, but it, uh, I don't even know if this is a good pass or not. But uh, it runs. Uh, it's it's per, it'll run eight five all day. I could put Tony behind a wheel and he could run eight five. Um, um, I don't think that's an eight five pass or what. But its personal best was uh, uh, down in uh, uh, Georgia, Georgia Motor Sports Park, and uh, I ran eight three at one sixty eight. So uh, it, it's it's fun, but when you get them car, you know, people think, oh my gosh, and it's not that fast when you're in it. It really isn't. I mean, it happens fast, but when you get a car that is set up, you know, all the suspension and the air's right, and and the the shift points and the computer's all right, and you get all set up. I mean, I could I could put my Chihuahua behind the wheel, and he could make a solid clean pass in the car. So it's when the guys are getting them, they don't know how to set the things up. And I'm not saying I do. Um, I have people for that. But if you get guys that get in there and, and don't have things set up, and that's when they start kicking side to side and, and all that. Yeah. I love how I, I was paying attention to that detail because I do enjoy drag racing. I, I watched how your back um, slick wrinkled up a little bit because you had just yeah. the right amount of uh, tire pressure. You didn't launch too hard. You gave it a little bit of gas. You didn't launch too hard, right? Yeah. Um, and then, and then you just are you controlling the gas with your foot or is it computer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but you get gas and foot pedal, which is rare. Okay. So mostly, mostly on uh, on drag cars, people's got what they call two step and a trans brake, where they can go up and you'll hear the cars will go up there and you'll hear them go pop, 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 pop right before they're getting ready to launch. Well, yeah. that's because they got. They put it in a computer. It's on a trans brake, and it's waiting for that light. Then you push button, and then they just take off from there. Me, I do it all, just just like you would your your car that you you drive home tonight. Yeah, you had that car for for a long time before you went hard on it like that. I it used to be red, and it was a street racing car for you, and then yeah. you went hard on it, right? Yeah, I've had, I've grown with that car. It's been it's been a good car to me. And then what I've done. Is it yeah, still for sale? You want it? You need Maybe. that. That's barter. No, no, no. <laughs> it's a high profile profile car, but nobody in California is going to know. So, I'm I'm in Texas now. I started, oh, are you? but yeah, I mean, we we have built a house in San Antonio, Texas. I've been here for like two years now. That car is, is amazing. Um, it's gonna it's it's gonna be somebody on a pro level drag racing um, level that's gonna buy that car. But wouldn't it be me. I'm not at that level with my skill set with my um, I, I think a, a six, like we, we have a $60,000 car in the, in the garage. Right. But this is a cash. This is a, this is a toy. This is, um, yeah. and, and then like, it's a, it's a different beast. Um, so I love drag racing. I obviously you're very advanced. Um, and I've been getting into like the suspension and trying to make sure that you, God, that suspension goes so far past power it's crazy uh how, what it does you know to, to yeah, give a lot of people think uh, with the rebounding compression and when you start learning rebounding compression it's totally opposite of what you think um, but a lot of people think uh that you know you want that the ass end to s drop down when you take off but no you want separation you actually want the wheel to go down and the body to go up because that's it's pushing and once, you, and that was just a hard concept for me to comprehend because I was thinking totally opposite with the rebound and compression, what does which. And, and once I got that figured out, I could dial in the car. And then I always kept the front end as loose as I could because I, I wanted to get that, all that weight transferred to the back. And plus everybody likes a wheelie. So. <laughs> so what'd you do? You went stiffer in the back? You go stiffer uh, in the back so it doesn't squat so much and it just squats I, a little. 
a little bit. I, I, you want the back end to fight against the, the rear axle. So when it's the, the axle pushes, it actually pushes the back end up, which actually drives it down and makes you connect or stick a little bit. Like I said, it's a, it, it's a, it's very hard to explain, but yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been working on that lately and, um, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. Well, I don't, uh, I'll help you out sometime. If you... Yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to, we'll, we'll connect in person. Um, but I did switch things up. I started getting into the off-roading thing and I built a couple Jeeps, um, not like your newer Jeeps. One was a, a 95 XJ and I made a big TX thing out of it, which is cool. Um, and then, uh, um, but just last year, this time that last year is probably my it was probably my one year anniversary. I bought one of them side by sides, and I was really anti side by side before. You know, it's it's uh, not built, it's bought, and, and they <laughs> are. I mean, the things are amazing. Point and They're shoot. Amazing. I mean, them yeah. things could just do anything, and mostly in two wheel drive. So, uh, but it got to the point that I'm getting tired of breaking down. I'm getting tired of working on them. I'm, I, I'm tired of upgrading things. I just want something I can sit in and enjoy. So, and plus the, the step up is 14 inches instead of three feet. So that makes a big difference as well. So I did do it. And what's nice about the side-by-side -side, drag, I'd travel around his drag car. I'd stay in a hotel three days and I might get six to 10 passes in an entire weekend. And, you know, twenty five, three thousand dollars $3,000, you know, if I didn't win anything, you know, is about what a weekend cost me. Um, that the side by side, I can literally show up at eight in the morning and run and never turn the thing off for 10 or 12 hours. And, <laughs> and it's just like, so it's a lot more rewarding, you know, as long as you pick different parks and keep things fresh. It, it's, uh, I, I enjoy, so I'm merging more into that. And as you can see, the drag car is up for sale. So, that's uh but we, we do enjoy the, the side by sides. I love I love off-roading as well. Glad you brought that up. I got into off-roading um like uh, I want to say three or four years ago. I, I bought this Hummer H2. It's still got it. I love it. What uh, what do you what do you drive in? It's a Hummer H2. Oh, okay. Oh, um that's, that's not gonna fit around many trees. <laughs> around no. Yeah, yeah, I stay, I stay, I stay away from the trees. I don't like the bushwhacking so much. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've, I've done a lot through it. I, I've taken it in the sand dunes in the deserts of California. I've taken it uh, up the mountains into, into. I don't really like mudding. I tried mudding with it. Yeah. Not really for me, it just ruins your car. I feel, you know, you need a mudding car and then just treat it like a mudding car. It's, it's um, I've also. Um, you know, it, it's a heavy truck too. These Hummers are heavy. You can't jump it. Tried doing that, messed that up. <laughs> you know, I think I, I didn't, uh, wasn't off uh, looking for something to jump. You're just out there having fun and have a few beers in your hand and you're going a little fast and, you know, yeah. shit happens, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, anyways, uh, off-roading is a blast. I, I got to be on four wheels though. Um, I'm not down for the two wheelers. I, no. I like the breathing. I like the adrenaline a little bit too much and I want to go fast. Yeah. So I want to go fast. I want to breathe though. You know, so two wheels. Nah, I, I, I used to have one actually, but I had to get rid of it because uh, I'm just, I get on it and I want to fly, you know? So, you know, you know, the best thing about off-roading for me, Tony is no cell service. No cell service. Nice. It, just to get away. Cause I mean, we're, I mean, 120 calls a day, text messages, emails. I mean, that's always in front of you. And then when you get out there, you, you, you I use my phone maybe to take pictures, but yeah. I can't download emails. I can't get texts and that that's, and I mean, it, it, you don't understand how much that phone controls your life. Oh, until you can go out and to the sand dunes or back in the woods or in the mountains of Tennessee and and just get away from it and just breathe. I mean, just the air quality out there is just so much different than, you know, what we're used to every day. So and even that morning chill is refreshing uh, out in the mountains. So I know what you mean. It is a stress reliever for me as well. And, and it, it does get my mind off of things. I even had to get myself some remote control cars so I can be at home and, and just yeah. step outside. And those are fun. You tinker with them, you know, but uh, Mr. Michael Cup, it's been super good talking to you today. Absolutely. Brother, anything else you want to touch base on before we go? No, well, this has been an absolute pre uh, pleasure. So um, and let me know if you want to get together when you help set up your car, get down that strip. 
Absolutely. I'm going to be hitting you up for some more tips. Um, this weekend, I'll be on the track, actually. Um, but it's going to be for drifting in the BMW. It won't be for drag racing. Uh, I'll send you some cool videos, though. Yeah, please do. I'm excited to see them. Yeah, right on, buddy. Okay, talk Take to care. you later. Thanks.